Hello, this is Linda Bolton for arttalks.co.uk in association with onlinearttalks.com. The Arnolfini Marriage, painted in 1434 and hanging now in the National Gallery. We've got here an image of two well-dressed young people holding or placing hand on hand and shown in a bedchamber. For a long time, this painting was called The Marriage of Arnolfini, although we're not so sure now that this is the case. But you can see why it was called a marriage. We seem to have a kind of solemn positioning of hand in hand, and Arnolfini, the figure here on the left, has his right hand raised as though to cross himself after receiving a blessing from an unknown, an unknown figure off stage. And I think it's a painting where everything we see has a double meaning, a straightforward one, a literal one, and then a hidden meaning. For example, the little dog in the forefront. It may have been that the painter was simply asked to include the dog here. But dogs in art represent fidelity, and perhaps it's hoped it's hope that the marriage will be a faithful one. We can also see that the figure of uh, Arnolfini's wife is shown here looking like she's expecting a baby. Whether she is or not, the jury's out. Maybe it's just that she's holding up the many yards of costume in her dress to show the wealth and uh, number of yards that go into this costume. But at the same time, it does make the shape of a pregnant belly and perhaps a reminder of the hoped-for fruitfulness of the marriage. And echoing that sentiment, we can see on the left fruit. There's a piece of fruit on the window sill, and more fruit on the coffer or the chest on the far left of the painting. Now on a straightforward level, it may be that these oranges or apricots, whatever they may be, are luxury objects, a way that the, pat the patrons who are paying the artist to paint this painting are saying, we've got money enough to import fruits like this from exotic places, from Seville or from Portugal or Italy. But on a symbolic level, they're a reminder that uh, perhaps the marriage might be, or the hope is that the marriage may be fruitful, that fruit may be born from this marriage. And just further glimpsable, out of the window, there's a fruiting cherry tree. And as we look at the class, not class, the hand on hand, slightly to the right of that and above, carved into the top of uh, an ornate chair is an image of St Margaret, patron saint of women in childbirth. So on a literal level, an indication of something that may have been found inside this bedchamber, but on a more symbolic one, um, a reminder of the protective function of St Margaret, patron saint of women in childbirth. We've got also, hanging from the wall, um, a brush, a reminder that cleanliness is next to godliness. And on the other side of this luxury object of a mirror, there's a rosary, um, a reminder of the piety that both this couple perhaps wants the artist to express. And between these two objects is a mirror, again, a luxury object, a reminder that these, this couple were wealthy. Above the mirror, there's a very fine and fancy uh, luxury object, a candelabrum. And where I think we cannot fail to read this image symbolically is in this chandelier itself. Although there's space for several candles, just one is lit, just one is burning. That has to mean something, whether it means two becoming one, whether it means a divine presence above, we're not quite sure. But something it must mean. In the same way, perhaps the clogs or patterns as they were known or the slippers tucked under the uh, settle at the back must mean something on a straightforward level they're just that uh, slippers and patterns but on a more symbolic one they might be a reminder that how shoes were uh, a symbol of um, good luck a bit like tying an old boot to the wedding bumper uh, the car of the wedding bumper as you drive off but if we look closely at the mirror, for example, we might be able to see that all round its periphery are little roundels, and inside the roundels, what we call the Passion of Christ, from his condemnation under Pontius Pilate through to 
death and resurrection. And as we look higher up into this chandelier, if we look carefully, we can see that one of the candle holders contains a burnt out candle. It may be that this refers to the death of the recent death of the young woman. And as we look closely at the mirror, we can see that the scenes of the dead Christ are on her side and of the living Christ are on the side of Giovanni, as is the living candle. So it may well have been a commemorative portrait made after the death of this young woman. In fact, it may be that she died shortly after giving birth to their child. And perhaps the painting itself was made from a miniature, which is why she looks rather idealised, whereas he looks so extraordinarily real. Another element of the reality, the naturalness in this painting, comes from its being painted in oil paint, which was a new medium at the turn of the 15th century and practised in the Low Countries, where this was made in, in Bruges. And Jan van Eyck, who painted this, is the first great practitioner in oil. Previous to this, artists would mix their ground pigment with egg yolk and water, which is very quick drying, not very good to make these effects of texture. But if pigment is mixed with oil, it's more slow drying, and you can get these fantastic effects of light shining on fur-trimmed velvet or onto a face, sending all these tonal... Uh, references from light to dark, making extraordinary effects of naturalism. A close look into the mirror shows you the back of Arnolfini and his wife, and between them, a figure in blue and one in red. Well, who might they be? Well, if this be a marriage, one might well be the priest, and the other the equivalent of the wedding photographer who'd witnessed it, and as though to say, I was here, I saw it, the graffiti above the mirror and below the chandelier says Jan van Eyck Fuit Hick, 1434, or Jan van Eyck was here, 1434. Signed, dated. The only thing we don't quite know is who exactly this couple was. <laughs>